Matthew chapter 14. Are you comfortable? Mm -hmm. Y'all thought I forgot, didn't you? <clears throat> Hallelujah. Well, well, well. Man, y'all look good today. I missed you. I know you didn't even know I was gone. But I missed you. Uh, you know, I shot a deer. Did you know I shot a deer a week ago? Did I tell y'all about that? We'll have a picture later on to show y'all. No, we won't do that. God, that's what I mean. God is so good. Amen. You can choose. This week has been as glorious as it has. It's also been very sad for earth and exciting for heaven. Four senior citizens that I've known and loved passed away in the last uh, eight days. Doc Sims, Wanda Sims, the husband who worked out at the ranch with us for quite a while, who took ill a few years ago, uh, passed away. Sister Brenda Johnson's mother, Dora, passed away this week. Uh, George Saxton, who uh, was with me in the North Campus for years, uh, I went and sat on the porch with him two weeks ago, and uh, we just talked. And he sat out there with me, and he told me, he said, Pastor, I'm leaving. And uh, I said, I, I know. And uh, we just talked and had a, prayed together, made sure everything's good. And he talked to me about getting on his knees and making sure he's right with Jesus. You know, I don't care how many times you think it, when you get close to the end, you're going to think it again. Amen. Because what hope do you have other than Christ? What hope do you have about eternal life other than Jesus? Amen. I mean, no other God. And you, you, you study the history of religion, there are no, there's no God anywhere that loves like our God. That forgives like our God. That gives us abilities and talents and created us. And once you look at it, all the others are false gods. That's why God said, why are you going after idols? Idols can't love you. Idols can't bless you. Idols can't forgive you. Idols are a terrible thing to have. They're a terrible representation of what divinity and God really is. So it's a very important to understand that there's no God like our God. Amen? And then uh, there's, that was three. And then Paula... Uh, uh, Daniel and Paula Thomas, Paula's mother, Imogene, passed away. Uh, she was in a nursing home, and all of these elderly, none of them by virus, all by old age, amen, passed away. But Imogene was funny. She, she was raised up in the Southern Baptist, and they didn't do anything in church other than be Southern Baptist. And when she started at our church, you know, and she, this was a few years ago, she'd come in, and you'd think she had a tambourine in her hand. Boy, she She'd clap, boy, she'd get into it. She loved church. I just loved talking with Imogene. And then she, her mind started slipping. And I went to the, to the uh, nursing home, or to, yeah, the nursing home hospital, the hospital to see her. And I said, how you doing, Miss Imogene? And she looked at me, and this is what she said. Son, I want to invite you to our church. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I played along with it, Sue. I just started working with her. I said, oh, yeah? I said, how is it? She said, oh, it's good. They, 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 they clap and lift their hands. And they're so excited. And I said, well, how's the preacher? And she looked at me and she said, well, he's all right. <laughs> I thought, okay, all right. I'll take that. Amen. I'll take that. So the, all four have passed away. This, so we'll be praying for our church and for those that are, you know, it's going to leave a tremendous void. They were great people. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for an opportunity to share it and preach it this morning. Strengthen my body and those that are here. God, this is our, going to be an opportunity for us to have a really tremendous week. So let us do it in Jesus' name. Everyone shout. Matthew chapter 14, verse 22. Matthew 14, 22. One of the things I'm concerned about at, at my age and time in life is I don't want to look back on a life with a deep, intimate, gut-wrenching, honest conversations that I never had with people or with God. I, I don't want to get to a place that I understood that there were great bold prayers that I never prayed, exhilarating risks that I never took, sacrificial gifts I never offered, uh, lives that I never touched. I want to make sure as I'm moving through life that I'm able to do these things. Oftentimes we realize there was a world of desperate need around us and nobody was kind, nobody reached them, nobody loved them. You know, what about the person that we say to ourselves, I wish this was the person I could have became? When I read what Jesus did and how he, how he worked with people, Matthew chapter 14, and I, you know, I've preached months on this passage, but I, I love it, and I just want to just touch on it, and then we're going to move on. It says, immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him onto the other side. While he dismissed them, so they're on the Sea of Galilee, and while he dismissed the crowd, after he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. 
When evening came, he was there alone. And I love the fact that Jesus talked to the Father. That he said, now, I don't do anything unless God tells me to do it. Amen. So I'm communicating to find out what it is I need to do next. So he had this moment of intimacy with the Father. But the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. During the fourth watch, it was about 3 3 a.m., about the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. They said, it's a ghost, they announced. They cried out in fear. Everybody say fear. Amen. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Now, again, I, and I told my pastor this morning, I said, Pastor, I don't want to make this humorous, but there's some funny things that go on in this story. First off, Jesus is walking on the water in a storm at 3 a.m. in the morning. Somebody said, why did he do that? I'm going to answer that question for you, because he liked it. All right? Amen. He just liked doing it. He was that kind of God. He, so he's walking on the waves. The disciples are in the boat. They see him walking on the water. They scream out, ah! It's a ghost. If you know anything about the tradition of the day, if at any time they saw a white tunic or anything that looked like an apparition on the water, they considered it a ghost. It meant that bad luck was next. And Jesus said, hey, guys, chill out. It's just me. Don't be afraid. Then Peter said, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. My message is about the gift of the call, the talent, the, 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 the blessings of God in your life that you've got that you could use if you want to use them. Peter decided to use him. He initiated this moment. Jesus said, okay, come. He said, then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. When he saw the wind... When he saw the wind, not felt it, but when he saw it, that's a powerful wind. He was afraid and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, everybody say immediately. Jesus reached out his hand, caught him. Ye of little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? You were doing it. You were walking, man. And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. And then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly you are the Son of God. When I'm reading this passage, I remind myself that there is heaven and hell. There's light and darkness. If I give myself over to the light, the darkness dissipates. If I give myself over to the darkness, the light dissipates. Peter gave himself over, initiated, walks on the water, not once but twice. He sinks in the water. Jesus lifts him up immediately, walks him back to the boat. I see hell shudder because a man decided that I'm going to use this gift of faith that I've got in my life, this gift of call that I've got in my life, these talents I got in my life to get out of this boat. Now, there's 12 in the boat. He gets out of the boat, walks on the water, comes back to, to the, to, to get, and, and, and to me, it's just an amazing story. And my mind floods with so many thoughts of our own lives, how that we've stayed shut in, how we've stayed uh, uh, incarcerated in such a place over the last, not just eight months, some of us for years, years, have not decided to use the gifts that God put into our lives, and we've allowed things to shut us down and not step out of the boat. When Peter gets out of that boat, hell had to shudder. Satan had to go, no way, look at it. And he's walking on the water. He's eyeballing Jesus. It's that, it's that amazing moment in life. And you've been there, man, when you believe God for something and it began to happen, miracles began to happen around you, or our finances flooded, our relationships got better, and he's walking on the way with Jesus walking. It doesn't say how far he walked. You can imagine it's some distance. Then he took his eyes off when the wind hit him. Things hit us all the time. They take our focus off the one we need to keep our eye on. He goes down in the water. When he does, Jesus immediately says, immediately. I love immediately. Had it been you, you would have let him go under the water and bubble a little bit before you pulled him up. You wanted to make sure he understood who you are, but not Jesus. On his way down, he grabs hold of him close enough to pull him back up, which which means he made the walk all the way to Christ. And then they turn and they walk back to the boat. And when Jesus gets in the boat, he says to them, you have little faith. You have little faith. Why did you doubt? Not just to Peter, but to everybody else there. Why did you doubt? Father, I love you again. Bless this word in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen. God bless you. you. May be seated. I believe that we've all been given a gift. The Word of God teaches this to us over and over, that God put gifts and talents inside of every one of us. And along with the gift, you've been given a choice. You can either sit on it or you can use it. You can sit on it or you can step out and do something with it. Peter did not ask for a promise. You know as I do that sometimes when you pray, you'll pray stuff like, Now, Lord, 
If you promise me, I won't sink. If you promise me, this won't fail. If you promise me that everything's going to turn out all right, I'll do this. Peter didn't ask for a promise. No, no, specifically for a command. He just said, Lord, if it's you, I, I just got to know it's you. First off, let me just say this. Who else do you know that walks on water, Peter? That takes the if out, don't it? If it's you, what do you mean if it's me? Who else you know that can do this kind of stuff? Hey, I don't know anybody else who can walk on waves like I do. Peter didn't ask for a guarantee, just an opportunity. And I think for us, we just need to ask for an opportunity. But those who had sat on their gift, stayed behind. They didn't want to risk the brokenness of failure. Did you know all 12 could have got out of the boat? All of them could have got, took a walk on the water. But they treasured safety over growth. They sit with those who want a promise of guarantee, not a mission. You know, God, I'll come back to church if you promise I won't get to... Pastor, I'll go back to work if you promise I won't get. Pastor, I'll get back around other people if you promise. I'll... See, I can't promise you that. I can promise you that I'm covered by the blood of Jesus and I live under the wings of God. Amen. And if something happened, I, I was so amazed. You know, I, I am a college football fan, and, and, the, and the team that I represent, that, that I like the most, is from where I'm from, Alabama. And the coach gets a uh, gets a test on Wednesday that he's got COVID. Now, not everybody can afford this, but if you make the money he does, and the university's for it, he, so he got it on Wednesday. So he gets tested again on Thursday, negative. Friday, negative. Saturday, negative. Which means Wednesday was actually. Negative. No, he was asymptomatic. No, he wasn't because he was tested a few days before then and he didn't have it. Amen. So now he don't have it. On, so it didn't work out. My sister-in-law has 100 people in her convalescent home in Alabama. They have to get tested twice a week. Do you know what the insurance company pays for twice a week? One time, $17,000 for 100 people. Then you double that a week. There are people making millions off of this virus and they're doing it out of fear. Oh, that's all right. That's all right. Yeah, I don't need no amens from y'all. I know exactly what I'm talking about. What I'm saying is, is that we, we've allowed things to keep us in. This ain't, and this ain't a sermon about getting out of the boat and, and, and face it. You've got to be smart. You've got to wash your hands, of course. You, you, you might want to keep your, you know, there's certain folk, I don't care with or without the virus, I don't get close to them anyway. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Forget six foot, I'm going to give you 30. Amen. You got cooties and I know it. Amen. So I ain't getting near you any. Okay. They, they, they knew the cost of getting out of the boat, potential failure, embarrassment. What if I get out and sink like Peter? Inadequacy, criticism. Somebody's going to criticize me if I get out of the boat. And per perhaps even a loss of life could happen. You know, I remind myself of that. Before I even get on my motorcycle to take a trip, I go and adjust my wheel. I do it every time. I go in. I thought this time, I thought, you know what? I want to make sure my grandson gets something this time. And if my, if my granddaughter starts liking me more, my next trip, I'll throw her on there. Come on, give me an amen. Oh, you don't do that? You got it just locked in stone? No, I, I'm, I'm seeing how you treat me. Amen. Then we'll see how, what happens on this thing. So I do it. Because, and I tell my son about it. I tell my wife, I'm, this is what I'm going to do because I'm going out. It's dangerous what I'm fixing to do. I know it's, it's risky. You don't run through the curves like we do and not be risky. But on the other hand, what an exhilarating feeling when it's over. Amen. It's one of them, whoa, man, can you believe we did that? Hallelujah to Jesus. Come on, give me an amen. You know, to stay behind in the boat, desiring to be passed by. Amen. Uh, you know, a few things in life to me are sadder than stagnation. To get middle aged, once fire shot through your, bone, your, your, your veins for the things of God, for, for a strong yearning to make a difference in this life. But somewhere along the line, the fire went out. You were left behind sitting in the boat. Amen. Along with all the others, the rain came down. Unrealized potential, unfulfilled longings. It leads to a sense of what I'm living my life for. What is it all about? The one I was supposed to live for, I'm not doing it. There's a high cost of being left behind, my friend. First, the fear that passes from generation to generation. Did you know that your fears will go into your kids? Amen. And everybody around you, if I'm scared of something, they're going to be scared of something. That's why you got to break that generational curse. Amen. It doesn't mean you got to get on a motorcycle and run curves. It doesn't mean you got to jump out of a plane. It just means you got to live. Amen. You just got to live. Hallelujah. You got you to do it. And, and you got to be careful about how you say things and what you say and think it through. And don't fall into superstitions. If a black cat crosses in front of me, he better do it quick. 
Because first, I don't care if it's black or white. I just don't like cats. Come on, give me, give me an amen. I mean, he better be moving if he's going across me. Amen. So, so you don't fall into it. You don't pass it down to other generations because it is generational. A loss of self-esteem. Imagine, I know Peter sunk, but I promise you there was something about that day that changed his life forever. He knew what Jesus could do, and by faith in Christ, what he could do, getting out of the boat. Third, the loss of destiny. What could happen if I just stay the way I am, and I don't use this gift that God has put in my life? The loss of joy. You can imagine the joy that happens in your life when you do. You know as I do. It's the risk in life that we take and the pressing in and living life that gives us that smile. Listen, you risk bringing children into this world. But when that child gets here, there's a smile on your face. Amen. There's a belief that something great is going to happen. So there's two ways to deal with this gift that God puts in us, the call, the talent that we got. First, in Matthew 14, 28, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you. Amen. Jesus said, come, get out, come on, walk on. And he walked on the water and came toward Jesus. Anytime a gift is given, a talent in your life is used, the recipient must choose to respond in, in one of two ways. First, this gift is valuable. It can't be risked. You know, God, I know you called me, and you, you've got things in my life, and I have the ability to, to do mechanical work, or I have the ability to sing, or I have the ability to do music, I have the ability to love children, I have, but, but I, I just don't want to risk that. If I risk it, you know, things may not go well, or sometimes the gift may be poorly used, it may not be admired by others, amen, it might even get broken. Or second, this gift is so valuable, I've got to risk it. To leave the gift in the box is to thwart the desire of the giver. If, if I give you a gift, and you don't open it you don't you don't you don't you don't get excited about it then then it breaks my heart the father above is the giver of gifts amen and he put gifts in every one of you he put it in your children your children's children and when he gives you a gift if you don't open that gift if you don't use what god gave you well how do you think that makes the giver feel i can promise this he probably won't give you another one Maybe, maybe he will. Maybe, maybe he just said, okay, he didn't like the way that one was wrapped. Listen, I don't care how it's wrapped. You give me a gift, I'm opening that thing. Amen. I got in yesterday. I went right in my office and somebody left a gift on, the, on my desk. I didn't say, well, I'll just wait till after Sunday. I did not. I pulled the paper out of there. Amen. I got to look and to see what that thing was in there. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I don't even know who it came from. Couldn't read their name, but thank you, whoever. Amen. Jesus it gives us opportunities. He offers, Matthew 25, he uses this parable to explain this about talents. He said, again, it'd be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. Let me tell you, the man was Jesus. His journey was back to heaven, and he gave his servants, which is you and me, the property of the earth. All right, let me break it down. To one, he gave five talents of money. To another, two talents. And to another, he gave one talent, each according to his ability. And when he went on his journey, listen, talents are given according to the ability you have. I, my sister was disabled, you know that, passed away four years ago in a wheelchair, 57 years old. Her talents may not have been as much as my talents according to my ability, but she had talents. She had the ability to make you smile. She could make you laugh. She was my sister, my friend. Amen. The aunt to, to my kids, amen, they loved her. She, had, she could make the best no-bake chocolate cookies on wax paper. You know what I'm talking about? That peanut butter with the, with, the, with the oatmeal. There you go. Thank you, Jesus. I can't even buy any because they don't even measure up to a, the talent my sister had. To one, he gave five. Amen. Verse 16. The man who had received the five talents went at once. Everybody say at once. Say it good. That's it. And put his money to work and gained five more. He also, the one with the two talents, gained two more. But the man who had received the one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. Uh, after a long time, the master whose servants returned and settled accounts with them. How many know the Lord of settled accounts is coming back? Amen. Jesus is coming back. I know you're saved by grace. You're going to heaven. Amen. Your name's on the roll. Glory to God. It's going to be a wonderful thing. Your, your, your phone's going to go off. The, the reservation be made. The little buzz is shake. You know what they do at the restaurants now. They give it to you and you get, get that little shake and get to go in. Yeah, you got that. That's good. But somehow what we do here is going to matter there because the Lord of the, of the accounts is coming back and he's going to look and see what did you do with the children I gave you? What did you do with the home I blessed you with? What did you do 
with the job I gave? What did you do with the talents I put inside of you? How were you toward other people with that? So it's an amazing thing. Understand, wealth during that time was concentrated among a few. They were very, very poor, and they were very, very wealthy. To get a talent was like 15 years' wages. So if I gave you five talents, that meant a lifetime of money that I just blessed you with. So it was an amazing thing. This is an act of unprecedented trust and generosity. It dawns on the first servant that this is an unbelievable opportunity, a chance to exercise initiative, to use judgment, test their skills in the marketplace, and potentially rise to positions of greater responsibility. Most likely there would be arrangements to share in the profits and the incentives. With one single act, the master changes all three of their destinies forever. This explains why Jesus said the first employee responded at once. Everybody say at once. I mean, he got excited. The employee jumps at the opportunity before the master might change his mind. It's a statement about the recognition of reality. I'll never have another chance like this. So he resolves that he will allow nothing to interfere with this, with this, and he seizes the opportunity. He will not be distracted or sidetracked. He has entrusted his property to you and me. Your talent is your life, your mind, your body, your spiritual gifts, yes, even your money and your will. There are no no-talent people. I've heard people say, well, I just ain't got no talent. Yes, you do. There are no no-talent people. You'll discover it if you keep going. That's why I appreciate the young people being here and others that come here because they're just now discovering what their talents are. And once you discover it, I, I don't care if it's making biscuits. I don't care if, it, if your name is Otis and your last, last name is Spunkmeyer. Some of you will get that later. Amen. So whatever your name is, because you don't know the talent and the gifts that God has until you start using it. So there's no, no, no talent. People, every gift is chosen by the master. You know, I may not like always the gift that I have, but, but he gave it to me. Not only that, God himself offers to partner with you. He offers to guide you when you need wisdom, encourage you when you falter, pick up you when you sink, and forgive you when you stray. He's the best of all gifts. Can I say that again to you? Amen. Not only that, God himself offers to partner with you. Amen. I'm going to give you the gift I'm going to teach you how to use it. He offers to guide you, and when you need wisdom, encourages you when you falter, pick you up when you sink, forgive you when you stray. He's the best gift of all. I've got to come to prize and appreciate that the Lord gave me these gifts and talents. Amen. And personally, we need to respond when called. Be intentional. Move to it. We have two days left in this life. What is it? Today? This day, that day. It's only two days we got Amen. So this day is so important in how I use my gift because that day is coming. Use your gift. Heed your call. Get out of the boat. Amen. Or, or, or look back someday at the life you should have lived. The implied question here is, what did you do with what I gave you? It's implied. What did I gave you five, gave you two, gave you one. What did you do with what I gave you? Matthew 25, 18. The man said uh, that he received the one talent, went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. When I skip down to verse 24, it says, Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew that you are a hard man. You reap where you have not sown, gathered where you have not strown. Amen. I was afraid and went and hid my talent in the earth. Lo, here it is. Here it is. I, I give it back to you. Well, you didn't, do, you didn't do anything with what I gave you? There's no interest on it. You could have put it in the bank, at least drawn interest on it. You didn't do anything with what I gave you. Amen. I, I, I mean, I, I, I entrusted that to you. I, I blessed you with that, and you didn't do anything. In other words, what we do here is going to matter when we get there, how I use what I got. I'm not trying to condemn anyone in this house. I, you know, I'll go back, I'll go back to the mountain where I came from, and I told my pastor, when I, when I go home, I remind myself how much God has used me. But on the flip side, if you get arrogant about it, you're going to be like Peter and sink. Amen. You've got to remind yourself that it was God that entrusted it to you, and you have the ability to do something with it. And everybody in this house has a talent, two talents. Five talents. Amen. And if you use it properly, five becomes ten. Hallelujah. Amen. So let me just say it like this. God ain't fair. Oh, no, he's not. Amen. Some of you were born in tremendous blessings and wealth. Others were. I took the guys. I took, you know, I had a group of folk out with me. Uh, and I took them into a, a, my bedroom when I was a kid. My bedroom
was from this corner to this wall, two bunk beds, that my dad later turned into the bathroom. That's my bedroom. And it came on a lean-to, which means if you were in the top bunk, you, <laughs> you didn't set up. That's where we were. And like I said, that became the bathroom because we didn't have a bathroom. We had an outhouse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, if you ain't never used the outhouse. Oh, I've used porta potties. Oh, those are nice. Those are sweet. But if you ain't never used the outhouse and had a Sears and Roebuck catalog, hey, man, you know what I'm talking about. Some of the older folks, some young folks go, Sears and Roebuck. You know, and to, to see where you come from, some people are blessed more than others, but I don't care how you would have done it when God put a gift in. And I love your stories, by the way. Many of you, yeah, I love to hear your story because when I hear your story, it reminds me. Listen, when God gave me the opportunity to hire David and, and Joseph, all I asked either one of them to do, and anyone that works in ministry in this house, use your talents. Use your talents. And then I have to discover what their talents are as we move along in life. And then try not to put them in a place where they're going to sink and feel uncomfortable. Are you following where I'm going? Amen. So when I watch people in this church take over ministries like, like Seniors with a Purpose or, or anything else, or even our band, how they do things, I watch at the door. I do not want anybody greeting that can't smile. You have no, God did not give you the talent to greet if you can't smile. If that is the face you got all day, please do not ask me, Pastor, can I greet people at the door? The answer is no. I almost said something there. <laughs> almost overemphasized that word. No, you can't. You're not called to do that. Amen. And you, you, your, your calling is going to be a little bit different. Probably security. <laughs> yeah, get your gun license and just hang out and look mean all the time. That's, that's your calling. Hallelujah. Amen. So how do we rationalize the, the burying of our gifts? You know, how about comparison? You know, I buried my, my talent because I realized I only had one and they had five. So I was scared. So I, I buried it. Comparison, my friend, will lead to pride and a false sense of superiority. If I'm ahead of someone in misery, I'm behind someone. So, so I, I can't do, compare. You know, God ain't going to ask you, what did you do with what you didn't have? He's not going to ask you what you didn't do with what you didn't have. You didn't have it. He's not going to judge you over that. Amen. But what did you do with what you had? Second, uh, you know, I was afraid. I was afraid. I was scared. Because you, 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 you're, you're, you're a bully God. You, then you misunderstood who I am. I'm not a bully God. I bless you according to your ability. Amen. So he wanted a promise that nothing would go wrong, not a command to do what was right. Fear makes people bury the treasure God has given them, thereby making them disobedient to the calling of the master. Some won't release their finances or, or be a blessing to the house of God because they're afraid that if they let it go, somehow God lied to them and, it, and they're not going to get a blessing back. Well, God says, if you'll open it up, if you'll be a blessing, I'll bless you back. Uh, matter of fact, press down, shaking together, running over, will, will others give toward you? And I've seen this happen over and over in my own life. For 40 years, I've been a tither and one that gives extra offerings. And not a boasting on myself at all. I'm just telling you, I've given myself into a place of blessing. And I find that it keeps working in, in all of our lives. I, I, I listened to a song on, you know, I have uh, music on my, my bike. And I was listening to a song by Rascal Flatts that said, I want to be running when the sands of time run out. And I thought to myself, God, if you took me right now, I'm running. I just want to keep moving when the sands run out. Because sure enough, your hourglass is tilted over. And if you're over 50, <laughs> no, let me back that up. If you're over 40, you're heading down. Yeah, yeah. You know how I know? That's how I know. <laughs> Amen. Hey, you know, because things just start, well, your earth suit starts wearing out. You know what I'm talking about. Hallelujah. Fear is not an adequate excuse for the tragedy of an unopened gift. The servant was not being judged for doing bad things, but for doing nothing. Amen. He didn't steal. He didn't embezzle. He just didn't do anything. Jesus uses strong words here. He called him wicked and lazy. Lazy is physical laziness. It is the failure to do what needs to be done when it needs to be done. Amen. You've got you to fight against procrastination. You've got to say, you know, if I've got to get this thing done, I've got to get it done. And you'll find out that you, you will rationalize in your mind not doing it will take you longer than just if you do it. 
If you just make the bed and wash the bike or, or take care of the dog or, or mow the grass or whatever it is you got to do, just do it. Instead of going, oh, I dread doing this. And then you can talk about it so long that it's done grown or gotten worse. Amen. Just do it. If you're not, you're going to end up being like a sloth. The sloth exists of, uh, the word sloth exists of loss of meaning, purpose, and hope, coupled with the indifference to the welfare of others. Have you ever seen, when the description Proverbs talks about sloths, have you ever seen a sloth? Are they, they the most amazing creatures? It's, it's like they'll put you to sleep moving. You have children like this? It's like, you know, you're talking with them, and, and, and they're going to get it done. It's, just, it's kind of like our worship. I never, never was one animal described that had such a definition that looks like that. I mean, had they named the cheetah the sloth, it wouldn't have worked. But, but Adam looked up there in that tree, and he saw that thing, and he said, sloth. That's you. That's going to be you. The reason the third servant got it so hard was simply for inactivity. Amen. Comfort. We love comfort. That's one of the things that causes us not to do anything anymore. Will often keep us from growing. Too much comfort is dangerous for us. Living demands challenge. We require change, adaption, and challenge. The way we require food and air. You know, I, I said this last week. I think I put it on social media. When, when a teacher wants a student to grow, they don't give them answers. They give them problems. When God wants you to grow, he don't give you answers. He give you problems. Amen. Some of you say, well, I, I sure, he sure wants me to grow a lot right now because i got problems. Well, good. Learn how to deal with that problem. Amen. And you'll grow from that. It is only in the process of accepting and solving problems that our ability to think creatively is enhanced, our persistence is strengthened, and our self-confidence is deepened. It's when you see a problem, you look ahead and you see it. That's why I love to be around great minds, because great minds, they think ahead. They see things, and when they do, they know how to fix it. One of the great things about ministry to me is to challenge ahead. I don't care if it's a, whatever kind of a, a conference, a car show, a regular church service. I see things ahead. If I can see it ahead, I see the problem. Okay, how are we going to deal with this? Even Amen. I, I can't, so that keeps you from panicking in the moment. Amen. To look ahead and see how this thing's going to play out and at least give a plan B. Have something working inside of you. Comfort is not a reason to have an unopened gift. Brother Joseph, you'd come on up and help me out here. Our call, our gift is connected to our purpose, which will become our passion. It will wake you up. Man, when you got a call in your life, when you got a passion in your life, we just want to live. It'll wake you up in the morning, my friend. It'll keep you going when you're tired. And I don't care if sometimes our passion could be our children, our grandkids or something. It blesses you just to know hey I got to keep going I got to get up I got to move after it it is an antidote to depression your call your gift amen it causes joy in the midst of great depression because I know that God has given me to accomplish cannot be stopped by anyone when you got a call in your life and this is what this is what he really hits me I meet people that learn, they, they, they run out of purpose they, they uh, have left their call they, they forget their talent and when you do that it's, it takes your hope away and if your hope's gone you will too. So you got to have something to pull toward. You got to have something to believe in. You got to have you got to give yourself something. Amen. You got to believe that when you ask God to forgive you for whatever failures you had, He forgave you. You got to realize the love of God in your life. The Scripture says that a man's gift makes room for him. That gift that God put in him and brings him before great men. I believe we were designed to be known for our gift. When I see certain people, actually, I can tell you something. They, I, I, you know, Dusty, just looking at you, and I know that you, you and Mike got involved in barbecuing. That's a gift, my friend. You, if you've ever seen me barbecue, you'll realize what a gift you two have. I got a Traeger grill, which is the baddest boy out there, and I can still screw it up. And it's, and it's, it's, it's made to where you can't screw it up. And yet, it'll kick off, something will happen, the meat's tough. I go, same, I'm going to go to Burger King. 
It brings you before great men. The gift you're sitting on is loaded. Do what you were born to do. Because that's where you will make your mark. You might, Alexander Graham Bell. Southern Bell. You know, it's the reason why we don't use smoke signals no more. Somebody invented something. Stepped out of the boat. Failed over and over and over again. Until they got it right. 2 Timothy 1.6 says, For this reason, I remind you. As Paul reminded Timothy, I'm reminding you. Fan the gift of God. Don't let it go out. Don't let it go out. Amen. King James says, Therefore I put thee in remembrance that you stir up the gift of God. Stir it up in you. You got a gift inside you, man. Use that gift. Use that gift. The gift that God gave you. It got Peter out of the boat. Amen. It did something with him. Andrew's gift was evangelizing, bringing people to Christ. Amen. Use the gift that you got. The call is not something we learn. It's something God gave us. It's something that we stir up. It's something we discover through life as we step into it. The joy of growth. There are few things that attract us more than growth. We're made to grow. And we love to be around growth. Garden, forest, spring. You know, we went through the fall of, of uh, North Carolina and Tennessee this week. Oh, my goodness. It's beautiful. It's attracting. Amen. There's something about it. Uh, whether it's gardens or forests. Amen. Watching the growth. The desire of God is growth. Thus the reason for a gift known as the call. Amen. God's always calling us to growth. Years ago I used a phrase. There's a reason why the wild woos you. Remember that D? There's a reason why the wild woos you. The wild. Who is Christ. Our holy wild God. Is always wooing you. Come on. Come on. Get out of the boat. You want out of the boat? Come on out of the boat. Amen. You, go lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. Cast out devils. You know, watch what I'm doing. You can do this. Amen. There's a reason why he's always wooing you to come a little deeper in the water. Amen. Come on out here with me. This is exhilarating life. See, when I first got born again, I thought all you're supposed to do is come in and sit and wait 50 years till you go to heaven. I promise you, that's what it looked like to me. Nobody was doing anything other than going to work and dying. And then I realized there's an exhilarating life. You know, I, I didn't hunt then. I hunt now. It's exhilarating. It's, that's why I boast about I, I know I'm an old man, but I get excited about going hunting. I get excited about eating the kill. It's, it's, it's wonderful. I get excited. Calories and cholesterol are my friends. Amen. I just love life. I love it. And, and you got to realize that's what life's about. And when your kids are being blessed, you're blessed. Oh, ain't nothing more blessed than see your children getting blessed. Amen. Watch them exhilarating and trying things and going through things. Oh. There's a reason why the wild woos you to come out, to grow. That's what he wants. You know, as your children grow, that's what you want. What is the Lord of the gift given to you that you need to open, that you need to invest? Whether it be your tithe, your talent, your treasure. I wonder, I really wonder if that morning a little boy was going and he heard Jesus was around and his mom said to him, hold on baby, I don't want you to go off without, without lunch. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pack you, I'm going to pack you two, two fish. I got two fish over here and you know, there's, there's two fish and then I'm going to put you some bread in here, baby. Now look. You make sure you hold on to your lunch. Because they told me when Jesus comes and preaches, there's a lot of people gathered around. And the little boy runs up there. His mama packs that little lunch. Little Jewish mom, she prays over that little lunch. Amen. God of heaven, look over this lunch and take care of my little boy. He's leaving the house today. He's going out with his gift. He's got his gift in his He got his lunch. Oh, bless him today. Bless that lunch. And G, it, it, no, see, no, she wouldn't say Jesus. She said, in Yeshua's name, amen. She sends him out, and he goes, and Jesus is preaching. Oh, he's preaching. He's probably telling the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are, 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 you know, he's just going down the line. That little boy just sitting there. 5,000 men and women and children. So if, if there's only three in a family, that's 15,000. Are you kidding me? Nobody had just one kid then. Hey, 20, 25,000 folk around. And here, here he is, and, and Jesus looks at him, and then he, he throws the question. 
What happens when the master wants you to grow? He gives you a problem. Here's the problem. They're hungry. They're hungry. The people are hungry, boys. Looks at his disciples. And the disciples go, there's nowhere to eat. Send them home. There's nothing to do. And all of a sudden, one of the disciples shows up. There's Andrew. And he says, I, I got, I talked a little boy out of his lunch. I talked a little boy out of his lunch. You want to talk about a miracle? Try to talk a little boy out of his lunch. That's a miracle. Then he gets the miracle there, and he, and, he, and, he, and, he, and he says, but what is this among so many? And Jesus said, okay, now I'm going to teach you something. And he reaches inside the little boy's sack lunch, and he grabs a sardine, and he snaps it. And the head grew a tail, and the tail grew a head. Then he snapped it again. And the head grew a tail. And the tail grew a head. And they dealing with, you fed a lot of people. You know, this takes a long time. So he gives it to the disciples. Uh-huh. You got to look at it right. And he said, now pass this out among the people. So they're starting to go down. And, and Peter takes a fish and he snaps it. And the head grew a tail. And the tail grew a head. And he handed it to Mildred. And Mildred snapped it. And the head grew a tail. And the tail grew a head. And she kept the head handed down to Fred. Fred snapped it. And the head grew a tail. And, the ta and then you got Andrew and Matthew and all of them going down the line. And they're just snapping fish and handing it out. How else is this going to multiply? They multiplied. The fish multiplied. It didn't get bigger when you put it in your mouth. Huh? They didn't eat off two fish. They, it had, this is the only way it could do it. And then, and then they tore the bread. And the bread begins, the tortillas begin to multiply. What do you think it was? Bread? It's tortillas. And, and, it, and it's starting to expand out through the people. And then, then when they finished, Jesus said, gather up all that's left over. And so... 12 guys go out with baskets and they gather it up and they come back and they set them down and they said how many baskets? Let's see, there's 5, 7, 10, 11, 12 baskets. 12 disciples. 25,000 people. One little sack lunch. One gift. One talent. It blessed all in people. And then the disciples got into a boat with their baskets and they sat down and a storm came up and Jesus was sleeping in the boat. He's exhausted. Ministry can be so exhausting dealing with people. He's in the boat. He's sleeping. Another storm comes up. Ah! We're going to drown! Jesus gets up peace be still where's the bread it's in the boat 12 baskets your gifts have never left you they have never left you the talent that God gave you he just asking you to open it and use it don't meander through life you get old and bald quick Life goes by too fast. Use your gifts. Heads bowed, eyes closed. God, before you now, is great people. You've invested talents and gifts. You put the call on their life. I know the scripture says, many are called, few are chosen. That's because many of the called have never used their gifts. So I ask God that we open our gifts this morning. That we rediscover what it is you called us to do. If you've been back then, just slip your hand up and pull it back down. Ain't no need holding it up for long. There you go. Thank you. Pray with me. Jesus, you're my God, my Savior, my King. You gave me gifts. You asked me to use them. I'm asking you to give me more faith. To expand my life. To be kind to others. Write my name 
from the Lamb's book of life. I never want to be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, give God praise again. Well, I don't know if I can preach this again. This is so much fun. I just, the Bible comes alive to me. I just see it. I see it happening all over. And I see it in my own life. I've seen my failures of sinking and calling out and getting back up and walking again. Use your gifts. Use your talents. Amen. You didn't just come to a Sunday service to leave. You came here to be challenged about some things, so use it. If you need to tie their offering envelope, there in front of you. Amen. If you give it online, go to Holy Wild. Dot net slash give those watching in the deer stand right now i know that some of you are in the deer stand you're watching me right now you got your little ipod in or whatever that thing is in your ear amen and you're 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 listening to me take your phone now it's a smartphone smarter than you are and figure out how to give and yank money out of a bank 500 miles away to put it over here into this house amen to be a blessing to the ministry here we're going to keep taking care of our missions all the things that we've got to do and continue to do. Amen. I want to tell you something. I, I'm living in such a way that there's, you know, I'm just going to live my life. And I just say this again. You do you. You just do you. I pray for your wellness. I pray God protects you, looks after you. Uh, listen, everybody I know are, uh, what's the word they use? If you uh, if you got a... Uh, you know, my mom's that way, I'm that way. If you've ever been sick before, pre-existing. Everybody I know has got pre-existing. Everybody's pre-existing. Everybody I know is handicapped. Amen. Everybody I know has disabilities. I mean, you got something. If I hang out with you long enough, I'll figure it out. There's something wrong with you. Amen. We're all there, but don't diss my abilities. Amen. Amen. We keep on going. David's going to come up and make a few announcements, and then we're going to proclaim together. Don't forget, uh, the big thing here is we will be having drunk or treat here. Uh, I'll be talking with some of the, the children's leaders and others. And that's just an opportunity for the kids to come by here and get candy in a very secure place. Amen. So we'll be on the other side of the fence giving out candy. They'll park here. And so for two hours, they'll have a place to come. Amen. And again, I say to our kids and our people, Dress appropriately as far as, don't, don't come up here looking like a demon. Hey Amen. I'll cast you out. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Ken, Ken Rich went, shoot. Amen. I just see Ken wearing a demon costume. <laughs> a little, little devil, exactly. Red tights and a tail. A little pitchfork. <laughs> Please come as that. <laughs> uh, Oh, wow. Well. Now through November 1st, TLCC Ladies Retreat, sign up and registration open. It's limited space availability and limited time to sign up. Uh, see Lucinda and Cheryl at registration table in the back. Ladies, anything you want to say to that? Anything they need? No? We're good? Okay, so in the back. If you have questions, in the back is a list of things that you will need to bring. Um, and uh, costs and, and times and everything. So they have all the information in the back. Today, lift, uh, ladies Bible study every third Sunday after service in the fellowship hall. See Miss Diane Phelan, which are, are you? Oh, there you are. I was like, I was like, sometimes you have to search. Yeah. Um, anything you want to say to them today? I'm excited about getting together today. I mean, October 19th, Wings, Widows, and Widowers meet Monday evening, 6 p.m. at El Himidor Restaurant in Humble. Uh, see Miss Diane Spurlock. Anything? There you go. Come on. Yeah, I mean, we all know people that have lost uh, people. So invite, invite folks. Uh, sometimes you just need some somebody that's been there. You know, I was joking with uh, Renee and... Uh, Oh, coach back there about uh, they, they understand each other right now because they both had the same surgery, you know, and Renee's a little further down the line. I said, you got to go to somebody been there so you know what to expect, you know. Sometimes we just we just need some friends. We need somebody to talk to. October 20th, two or more prayer group um, meet every Tuesday night except the first week, midweek of the month. Join the prayer team this Tuesday night. And, again, if you drop your prayer request in the back, they will be praying for that. And again, if you need 
help with something in your life, there's no greater opportunity than to have your friends praying for you. Uh, it's, a, it's a big deal. Um, drop them in the box, uh, CHD Kennedy uh, for details, or Ms. D. H is hunting, I'm sure, right now. Bless him, Lord. I pray that I pray that the biggest bug he's ever seen in his life shows up today. I do, because I pray the same thing for myself every time I'm out there. <laughs> that it, a trunk or treat? Uh, well, uh, apparently they changed it to six to eight. That's all I can tell you. It's going to be from six o'clock to eight o'clock, um, and that will be here. Um, again, and, and bring your cars, make them, make them fun for the kids. Yeah, two hours. That way, and it's just when it's just starting to get dark, that way the kids, again, it just gives them a safe place. We know as the sanctuary, that's our safe place. Not everybody in this community understands that. And so we get an opportunity to be able to show our community this is a safe place for them and their children. And that's what we need to do. We need to continue, like Pastor said, be kind, be loved. That's how others will know that you worship the Father. I said, by your good deeds. So if we reach out and we can just give the kids a safe place on Halloween, it's huge. And their parents see that. They see that. The kids is asking, Mom, I want to go to that place on Sunday. Why? Because they, they got candy. If it takes candy to get somebody in church, my God, I'd give them some candy. I guarantee you get my kids in church if you give them candy. They know where it's at, right in the back. Uh, and again, uh, so one thing I do want to uh, announce that's not on here is going to be um, on every other Tuesday night, we're going to start SWAT back up again. Our youth is going to be meeting on every other Tuesday night. And so we're going to be coinciding with the prayer. So parents, bring your teens, come and pray, hang out. I think it's a great opportunity. At first, I was kind of hesitant because I didn't want to take away from, but then I realized and thought about it, and I thought, you know what? I think it's going to add to. And so I think it's just an opportunity for all of us to get together in the house and to be able to, again, reach our community. That's what we need. Amen? Today, we're believing for God for jobs and better jobs. More money, less hours. Benefits, sales and commission, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates and returns, debts to malls, royalties received, favor and success to the kingdom and all the hunters. Amen.